Okay, this video is called, Is Psychology a Joke? I've talked about psychology before, and I actually, I know a lot of psychologists, and I like them, okay? So, there's a lot of good things about them. There's some other things about psychology that are quite stupid, and I think they are a joke, but there's a lot of good about psychology as well. Okay, so the purpose of this lecture is to help people who are interested in psychology, to help themselves, to help their friends, and to understand these situations better, okay? So, what do I think is good about psychology? I've noticed a lot of psychologists, they really care about the patient. They want to try to help the patient. They'll spend a lot of time talking to them. Psychologists tend to have more time to talk to a patient than a neurologist does. So they're going to go into more detail. And a lot of times that's necessary to get to know the person, to understand the person. And psychologists will a lot of times figure out things about the patient that the neurologist might miss because they don't spend as much time with the patient typically. The neurologist is under more pressure. You're a doctor. Go make money. Go make money. So... That's all good. Um, I know they want to help the patients. I've had psychologists ask me questions before and they genuinely really want to learn more about the brain and try to help their patients. So I think all of that is good. Then the question arises, well, why do I say in some ways psychology is a joke? Well, because I think if you go back in time before 1900, before Freud, patients, people would often go, you know, they talk to their family members. And then they'd often go talk to the priest. The priest was literate and was often seen as one of the wiser men of the community. And what I'm getting now is psychologists, in a sense, are kind of like becoming the priests of science. And, you know, at first glance, the modern person will say, isn't that good? Isn't that good? The patients are being treated with science. But you have to remember what the word science means. Science in the modern world means advertising to sell drugs. Okay. There's very little real science. Most medical journals are fake. They're just nonsense to advertise drugs. So what I'm saying is a psychologist potentially can be corrupted where they're just feeding patients into the drug mill, okay? You know, the old joke, McDougall had a joke that if a patient has chest pain, goes for a cardiac stress test, that's a conveyor belt to the cardiac cath lab and then the open heart surgery uh, cabbage room, okay? Coronary artery bypass graft. And what I'm saying is, Sometimes psychology can function like that as a conveyor belt to just send the patient on to a psychiatrist where they get drugged with a bunch of drugs which usually don't work and cause brain damage and potentially the equivalent of a mild chemical lobotomy, okay? Uh, one has to be careful about that. Okay, anyways, let me go back. I'm going to briefly go through a little history. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of paintings. Um, so Freud came along and he was kind of new, part neurologist and this part new psychoanalysis stuff. He went and studied with Charcot. I'm sorry I forgot to include that painting. If you want to look up that painting, it's um, Charcot at the Salpetriere, the name of the hospital in Paris. And like Freud would be one of his students in the audience. Charcot was a very famous French neurologist who started drifting from pure neurology. He described, you know, Charcot Marie Tooth disease, Charcot foot arthritis of the foot from diabetes. And he started drifting into, you know, like hypnotism and psychosomatic disorders. And you'll have it with the fainting patient, the fainting lady and all that stuff. Okay. Um, so what do I like about Freud? Well, Freud was kind of innovative. You know, we still remember him to this day, but there's a lot of things about Freud that were bad. Freud claimed that humans don't have a soul, that they don't have free will. The goal of life is sexual gratification. He would turn his back on the patient, claiming that would be more objective. And he would also degrade the patient. You know, the reason you're messed up is because your mother and your father are jerks, you know. And almost like communism, trying to get them to denounce their parents. Freud would do things that a lot of people, modern people don't know. He'd recommend electric shock treatments for a wife if she was frigid. Um... Carl Krauss has a good quote about him. He says, psychoanalysis causes the disease it pretends to cure. When you study psychoanalysis, it really is a joke. I'm not just saying that. You study it. The more you study it, the more you'll see what a joke it was. Uh, this guy, Thomas Shaz, was a brilliant guy, psychiatrist. He was real popular around the 1960s and after that. He wrote a book called, um, gosh, what do you call it? He wrote about psychiatry, just what a joke psychiatry and psychology were, in his opinion. Um, and one of the things he said, he said, Adler and Young were an improvement on Freud, but they didn't go far enough. The key is meaning. Meaning is what sets people free. Now, if you talk about meaning psychology, you're kind of getting into like Viktor Frankl's idea. Viktor Frankl is a guy who was in, uh, you know, concentration camp and he wrote a great book. Um, and that kind of goes back. There's other people who said that Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, but it's true. If a person has meaning, they can endure a lot more. They can bounce back from a lot of their sadness. But 
Um, I think it was the, the Myth of Psychiatry and the Myth of uh, Psychotherapy by Thomas Schaas. Trust me, if you're interested in these subjects, you want to read Schaas. Schaas, uh, Schaas is really good. Uh, he's, he's a brilliant guy. He's like a genius, Thomas Schaas. Okay, um, let's see what else. What was different? Adler felt that motivation was not always sexual. It was quite often social factors, like the Alfred Adler inferiority principle, that a man suffers and feels degraded in one way, and he tries to bounce back and compensate in another way. And I think that perfectly fits me. I felt sad and degraded by going from being a great athlete to being you know, kind of mediocre in comparison with what I was in the past. And I compensated by putting my energy into academics, trying to create a new life out of that. So that's an example of the Alfred Adler inferiority principle. Carl Jung was different in the sense from Freud that he felt that man needed religion and he had a big emphasis on religion uh, as part of his therapy and that was part of his falling out with Freud. Okay, um, the one guy too who I love is Soren Kierkegaard and I have a whole entire separate video on Kierkegaard but I think v Kierkegaard pretty much is what I go by in real life. What Soren Kierkegaard said is basically you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. So do the best you can. You know, like you could you could phrase that. For example, I'm basically an academic genius, and we're becoming a communist country, and the communists kill all the geniuses. So I'm screwed. Okay, but until that time comes, I'll do the best I can and try to save the proles. And like all these stupid people, Tom, I don't know what I'm talking about. I've studied communism backwards and forwards. I know tons of people that lived under it. Okay, why don't you look up what happened in Katyn? Okay. Um, there's reality for you. All right. Uh, let's see. What else? Behaviorism as developed by B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner, you know, 1904 to 1990, the American guy out of Harvard, he basically said humans don't have free will. You train them like you train rats with a motivational Skinner box where there's rewards and punishments. Um, he just wanted to control people. How can we control people? He didn't even really care why. He just wanted to figure out with rewards and punishment, how can you get the best control of people? Part of this modern, humans are just animals. Let's make them into slaves. And I was reading about B.F. Skinner and psychology, and then I read about something called the Skinner box. He would have like a pigeon in a box where there would be a little food pellet reward, and there would be punishment with shocks, and he could train the pigeon to do a lot of things. And I thought, that's ridiculous. That has nothing to do with anything in my life. But then I thought about it some more, and I realized, wow, my house is like a Skinner box, and my wife is the trainer, and I'm the stupid pigeon. You know, seed shock, seed shock for the pigeon. But for me, it's like... Well, the wife is nagging sex, nagging sex, nagging sex. Do as I say. Now give me all your money. Uh, so, anyways. All right. Um, Carl Rogers came along, and he had what was called the unconditional pos personal regard uh, for the patient. So he's very supportive, kind of like the male version of a loving father-mother figure all wrapped into one. He didn't really have a specific role or standard to go by, but his therapeutic conversation, you know, he'd leave his questions open-ended. Those are called Rogerian questions. And um, some people were actually mad at him. They felt that he was refuting psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis was still very powerful at that time, you know, like around 1960. It was gradually being pushed down and faded out because it was so bogus. Okay, but Carl Rogers was a bit of a transition person to the more friendlier version of psychology. Um, and to some extent, you know, Carl Jung was that as well, and Adler. Adler died kind of young, I think, from cardiac disease. Okay, Hans Einzig, he was a researcher, and he really uh, was very negative about psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. He said, ah, it's just the prostitution of friendship. Einstein said that there's an inverse relationship between recovery and psychotherapy. The more psychotherapy, the smaller the recovery rate. Okay, and I kind of laugh at that because there's actually been something like that shown with these psychiatric drugs. Psychiatric drugs are much more harmful than people realize when they're taken for a long duration, especially. Okay, and, and some people need an intelligent friend that a psychologist provides, in a sense. Somebody who they can sound their ideas off of and get some feedback, and that can be very valuable to them. Um, but what they don't need, like I said, they don't need somebody just feeding them into a psychiatrist saying, now you must get all these drugs. I mean, it's, a lot of times that's what happens. That's not good. We talked about psych drugs you know, causing brain damage, being like a chemical lobotomy in a lot of cases. When you look at the long-term results, you'd be shocked how bad they are. And look at schizophrenia. You know, they did a lot better in soteria than they did with drugs. Uh, the old Mosher uh, research on that. Okay, Abraham Maslow came along, you know, like around the 1960s, he's guy too, talking about, 
emphasizing self-actualization, helping a person to develop themselves, to reach their full potential. He had this idea of the pyramid of needs. And um, again, I like Viktor Frankl, you know, the idea of saying man should seek his purpose. If you seek like a purpose and also helping other people, all that kind of stuff. Okay, cognitive behavioral therapy that was developed by Aaron Beck and David Burns. I jokingly call that the Shakespeare method. You know, it's from the quote in Hamlet where he said, there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And that's a very heavy relativism. You know, Hamlet was going through some difficult times, of course, with what happened to his father and his mother and Ophelia. Okay, um, David Burns book, Feeling Good, it basically says you just try to change your attitude about your situation and that can cheer you up and make everything better. But the truth of the matter is you can't be reasoned out of something you weren't reasoned into. And sometimes you are just sad. I was sad when my mother died. Okay, there was nothing to change that, you know. You, um, oh, and some interesting things. that In this one study, the suicide rate was doubled by antidepressants and halved by psychotherapy. Psychotherapy worked a lot better than antidepressants. So... Uh, that was pretty bad. And they had four times higher suicide rate than psychotherapy in that one study. Okay, although psychiatric medicine sometimes can be helpful in the short term, especially for a psychotic episode, a schizophrenic break. Uh, what are some other options out there? Okay, Arthur Schopenhauer. And again, I go by this in my own life. He said, a happy life is impossible. The highest a man can achieve is a heroic life. The best source of happiness comes from who the man is. So basically, you can't control the events in your life. You can't control the fact that sad things happened to you, people betrayed you, people you love died. But you can say, I'm going to do the best I can with what I've got, okay? And that's what you should do. Like for me, I know the best I could do is get on the internet here and make videos and try to help people and teach people and try to, you know, preserve civilization, tell you the truth about stuff because, you know, that's the best I could do. If there was something better, I would do it. But this is the best I could do, so that's what I do, okay? Um, and like I said, my kid will say to me, why don't you go on vacation? Why don't you go to the beach? Because I'm not interested in any of that stuff. This is sort of where I see a purpose for myself. And everybody has to figure out for themselves, what is that purpose? And when you when you pursue that purpose of what you think is the best you could do, you're happier. Because I'm a pretty happy guy. My kid will say to me, why are you so happy? Your life sucks. You work all the time, and when you're not working, you're always writing books or making videos. Why don't you just... You know, go on vacation or go to the beach or something. I'm like, why do I want to do that? Well, anyways, what I'm trying to say is that's kind of what it's all about. And Schopenhauer is giving good advice. Schopenhauer was a great genius. He was a little bit pessimistic and sad. There's always something crazy about every genius. But he was very good. Okay, here's the quote from Dostoevsky. The mystery of human existence lies in not just staying alive, but in finding something to live for. Okay, okay, um, okay here's Viktor Frankl. Man's search for meaning is the chief motivation of his life. Once an individual's search for meaning is successful, it not only renders him happy, but it also gives him the capability to cope with suffering. Yeah, and I would totally agree with that. If your suffering seems meaningless to you, then it's more painful. It's more difficult to endure. And that's why atheists are more likely to commit suicide. I've known some people who are good people, but they're atheists, and when they have some disappointments, they just commit suicide. Um, so, you know, having believing in God and Christianity is a great way to get one sense of, you know, playing their role in the big cosmic drama of good versus evil and, you know, trying to be the best person they could be. Okay, so where does meaning come from? And, you know, a big spot where meaning can come from, obviously, is loving relationships for one's family and friends, etc. Um, and also, like, I kind of like Kierkegaard's attitude. He basically says, you know, to... Uh, to pursue new things and be the best you can be is like riding on a stallion. To just conform and go along with the old simple ways of doing things is like uh, falling asleep on a hay wagon. And as I said too, either way, you're kind of half screwed, so you might as well do the best you can. Um, and also, you know, count your blessings, all right? I was talking to this one lady doctor. She's a very nice doctor. She's got some health problems, and she's kind of frustrated and a little bit sad. And I'm like, why are you whining so much? Okay, you're lucky to, you were born smart. You're lucky you were born beautiful. You're skinny. You're smart. You're kind of wealthy. Okay, yeah, you got some health problems. But, man, it could be a thousand times worse, okay? Most people are dealing with a lot more problems than you are. Um, and besides, you, you know, she was kind of like half-assing on my advice. You know, she's like asking me for advice but doesn't want to follow low-fat, low-sodium vegan. I'm like... <laughs> You know, take it or leave it, okay? It's your best chance to improve your health. All right. Uh, 
in terms of like how does Christianity help with a lot of psychology almost related things. For example, look at Alcoholics Anonymous. The persons who need it, that person who's an alcoholic needs to replace the alcohol with something new in their life. And the ones that convert to Christianity or devote themselves to Christianity, they get much better results. Go ahead, look it up for yourself, study it. I spent a while studying it, okay? And also, you know, the, the Bible and the words of Jesus, they're pretty solid. Go, what did he say to the adulterer lady? He didn't say, you know, go have fun. He said, go and sin no more, okay? Don't do it anymore, all right? And biblical thinking works. Thou shalt not eat meat, thou shalt not eat oil, etc., etc. And so that's a great thing about Christianity. It provides a moral foundation. Obey the Ten Commandments. Okay, and here's a quote by Richard Gans in his book, Psychobabble. He wrote about why, you know, basically what I'm saying here is the psychology of Christianity is better than the psychology of psychology. And then some people say, oh, no, psychology is based on science. Oh, yeah, right. Every new fad that comes along, they always take it because they're part of the establishment, okay? They can't even tell you the difference between a man and a woman. How is somebody who can't tell you the difference between a man and a woman going to give you good advice about relationships? That's BS, okay? And then every guy I know that's ever been involved in the divorce business, you know, said the psychologist you know, was encouraging the wife to get a divorce, okay, to break up the family, okay? Uh, Christianity tries to keep families together, okay? Uh, the modern legal system is designed to favor the woman so heavily that she sees it in her self-interest to get divorced. She thinks she'll come out of it, okay? What I've seen in a lot of divorces is the woman's not that upset, and she comes out of it with more money than, you know, really she deserves, but the kids are screwed up. I've seen kids commit suicide after their parents get divorced. I've seen medical students drop out of med school and become drug addicts. I've seen other really bright people drop out of college and need years to kind of get it back together. Um, I've seen a lot of tragedies from divorces, okay? Um, let's see, all right? So here it is, the Bible. You want to know what's right and what's wrong? The Bible will give you the Ten Commandments here, okay? This is a beautiful painting by Arnold Freiberg. I'll let you, if you want to, take a look at that one, okay? Um, there it is. That's a great movie, too, with Charlton Heston. Arnold Freiberg made the painting illustrations that go with the movie about the Ten Commandments. That was the one that was directed by Cecil B. DeMille, starring uh, Charlton Heston. It's a great movie. Okay, and then Christianity tells you, well, how am I supposed to behave? Christianity has no problem answering that question. You're supposed to be good. In the cosmic war for good and evil, you are to be on the side of good, to do all the good you can, to help all the people you can. Like John Wesley said, do all the good you can with all the energy you can, every chance you can, okay? And basically, if you're be good, you theoretically, you know, you're going to get rewarded and go to heaven. If you're bad, you're potentially going to go to hell. There's a lot of controversy about hell. And that's why I, I, we'll, we'll get into that some other time. But there are some great Bible scholars who say that there really is no such thing as hell. I don't want to get into all that purgatory and all that. I know all that's a concept. But this idea of heaven and hell, reward for good deeds, punishment for bad deeds, it's an important concept, and without it, I don't think most people would behave. Um, but and by the way, if you want to talk about art? Look at this. This is Michelangelo's painting of the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel. It's magnificent. It's sublime. It's better than good. It's it's incredible, is what it is. Christianity is so much better than the art from Christianity is not a little bit better than the art from any other culture. It's a thousand times better. Now, if anybody can tell me there's any type of painting that's worth 1,000th of all this great Christian painting. Let me know. Put it in the comments. I'd be happy to see it. I always make this offer. Put it in the comments. No one has ever put anything in the comments, okay? I make tons and tons of videos about art. It's magnificent, okay? And then the story of Christ. I'll give Jordan Peterson credit. You know, Jordan Peterson says a lot of stupid stuff, a lot of weasel stuff. He badmouths Andrew Tate and a lot of other people. But you know what? Jordan Peterson said a great thing about Christ and the story of Christ. He said he was the greatest person who was treated the most unfairly and who suffered the most, and it's the greatest tragedy of all mankind. The best person had the worst punishment that was totally unfair, and he was totally innocent. Uh, so anyways, here is him, you know, giving the Sermon on the Mount. And what did Christ say? The main thing is, be nice to each other, okay? <laughs> okay, here's another thing about Christianity. Christianity says, you as an individual are responsible to Christ, to no one else, and to God, and you must do the right thing. So the great story of Christ was, you know, Bar uh, Pilate called out, from his uh, tower there, okay, who should we crucify? Should we crucify Jesus Christo or should we crucify Barabbas? And the people said, free Barabbas, free Barabbas. And so Christianity teaches you that was wrong. And someday you'll be faced with that decision where the popular thing to do will be the wrong thing and you as a Christian should do the right thing, okay? And so it teaches you morality. It teaches you right and wrong. Psychology, does psychology know what the difference is between good and bad? I'm not so sure it does. 
I don't think it, I'm not aware of it having any moral code or anything, okay? You ask a psychologist, who are your role models? I don't know. <laughs> in Christianity, it's very clear. And Christianity also is syncretic, meaning that it can take up information from the past and from other cultures and incorporate it into a Christian lifestyle. And it fits. It just works, okay? For example, Nietzsche had said that Christianity is just Platonism for the masses, okay? And here's a famous story of Plato. Plato was kind of a little bit, he was a genius, but he's a little bit pompous, and he classified man. He said, man is simply a featherless biped, okay? So Diogenes then uh, plucked the chicken and said, here's Plato's idea of a man, and put him into the, the school area there, the Lyceum, okay? Um, or Plato's Academy. Anyways, uh, Plato's defined man as a featherless biped, I thought that was kind of a funny painting. But what I liked about Plato was I liked his Republic, the way he, he had all these characters like a play, because he was a frustrated playwright, having a dialogue together, and it made him very entertaining and useful as discussions. And I sometimes get mixed up. Aristotle's Lyceum versus Plato's Academy. It's been a while since I've thought about that. Okay, I think the best thing Plato ever did was make this allegory of, um, of a cave. And again, this is very Christian in its thinking. Most of the people are going to be stupid chumps and not know what's going on, but you should try to seek the truth. And once you know the truth, you should come back and try to teach the other persons the proles. Even if they're just going to get pissed off, you should at least give it a try. So, I mean, that's about as Christian as it gets, the allegory of the cave. Okay, and then the other thing about Christianity being syncretic is here we are. We're in the Vatican, okay? This is in the Stanza Signatura, the signature room in the Vatican, and you've got this painting, The School of Athens by Raphael in 1511. It's incredible. So right there in the center, you've got um, Aristotle and you've got Plato. And Aristotle sort of pointing up in the sky at the, at the perfect forms, his theory. Plato is, I'm sorry, Aristotle's pointing down to the ground and being more practical and objective. He was a biologist, was sort of his main thing. Um, and all these other great scientists from history. So it has respect for history. It has respect for tradition. And these are mostly Greek scientists and philosophers and artists, but then you have mostly Roman architecture with the arches and the other sculptures and whatnot. Some of that's Greek as well. But anyways, it's beautiful. It's magnificent. And take a look at Ayn Rand, okay, the closet Christian. Okay, I love Ayn Rand. I know she can be a grouchy little bitch, but man, is she a genius. Here's a quote by Ayn Rand about Aristotle. If there is a philosophical atlas who carries the whole of Western civilization on his shoulders, it is Aristotle. Whatever intellectual progress men have achieved rests on his achievements. Aristotle may be regarded as the cultural barometer of Western history. Whenever his influence dominated the scene, it paved the way for one of history's brilliant eras. Whenever it fell, so did mankind. Aristotle is the father of individualism. Yeah, Aristotle was great. Aristotle said the first step to an intelligent conversation is to remove emotions. Like Ayn Rand, he said, be objective. Be as objective as you can be. He's the opposite of Immanuel Kant, who claims that nothing is objective, okay? And that's why Ayn Rand hated Immanuel Kant. And that's why people who feel that Immanuel Kant was trying to destroy the mind, trying to make people stupid so they couldn't think. Okay, so anyways, I love Aristotle. He's one of the smartest men who ever lived. And he sort of led the way to Thomas Aquinas and... Um, sort of the birth of the modern university. A couple other great figures from ancient Greece that are relevant, because like I said, ancient, you know, the uh, New Testament was written in Greek, okay? Um, here is the Acropolis, the city on a hill, and that's a big metaphor in Christianity. And the Greeks would have their meetings out here on the Acropolis, and there's a statue of Athena, and it's quite beautiful, the city on a hill. Respect for great men like, you know, Pericles. Pericles, you know, he screwed up in some ways. I think he should have not started a war, obviously, with Sparta. But Pericles is giving his funeral oration here in front of the Acropolis. It's a beautiful scene. And it's a beautiful story. The book uh, by Thucydides, you know, the Peloponnesian War is a magnificent masterpiece. Okay, and then just another figure from classical learning. This is Cicero in Rome. He's the greatest of all the Romans, okay? Aristotle is the greatest of all the Greeks, okay? Cicero is the greatest of all the Romans. And you'd be amazed if you, you start reading some Cicero and his quotes, what a genius this guy was. And here's one of my favorite quotes by him. To not know what happened before you were born is to forever remain a child. You have to study history or you're an ignoramus, okay? And this is the painting, Cicero Denouncing Catiline, okay, by Cesare Maccari. Um, 
Okay, here's something, Aristotle. If you want to understand something, then study how it was made, where it comes from. Yeah, if you want to understand Western civilization, study where it comes from. Study the Bible. Study the ancient Greeks. Study the ancient Romans. Study the Renaissance. Those would be the beginning steps. to. Once you do that, you'll be able to figure things out. There's, of course, always more. Okay, so the Bible, if you ask a psychologist what's a good book or what's the best book, psychologists can't tell you. You ask a Christian what's the best book, it's obviously the Bible, okay? Western civilization is based on the Bible. And I can tell you, if you want to understand current events, you'll find the answers in the Bible, okay? And I say this, I'm not dogmatic about religion. I think, you know, all Christians are pretty much the same to me. I don't really care about the details, but I will tell you, so many things, the knowledge comes from the Bible. If you don't know the Bible, you don't have to be a scholar of the Bible. You just have to know some basic stuff. You should know Genesis. You should know the New Testament. You should know Acts. And there are a few other things you should know too. But if you just know that, Revelation, you, you'll be able to make sense out of tons of things. You'll understand common prophecy. You'll understand, you know, a biblical perspective on events. And a lot of stuff goes down that path. Okay, and a lot of times communism will make a joke based on Bible prophecy. So even though it was done intentionally, perhaps, rather than coming out of the Bible, it's based on Bible prophecy, okay? And so it's highly valuable to read the Bible. If you haven't, don't know something about the Bible, how can you read English literature, okay? How can you make sense of Western civilization? And of course, here's the most important painting of all time, the creation of Adam, where, you know, God touches his finger, he comes to life, so to speak. And this is the idea that man is created in the image of God. Therefore, although he is part beast, he is also part divine. And therefore, he is entitled to natural rights, the right to property, free speech, and privacy. Okay? And if you don't have this biblical concept, then you're not even a person. You're just an animal, an ape that talks. And what people don't understand is it all comes down to this painting. This is metaphysics right here in this painting. And what did Ayn Rand say? She says, art is a concretization of metaphysics. It's where metaphysics are made manifest. In a painting, people, most people can't understand philosophy. Or all. They can get this. And this is what it all comes down to. You're either human created in the image of God, who's thus entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as a declaration of independence said, or you are a talking ape who has an owner and who belongs in a cage and must do what it says, Okay, must do what it is told. Okay, It all comes down to this. There's no escape from this. And that's why people who think you can be okay without God, they don't know anything. They're, they're ignoramuses. A lot of people can be very nice, but, you know, Cicero said one may smile and smile and be a villain. And what I would say is people can talk and talk and gossip and all that stuff, but if they don't know some of this basic history, they, they're really, you know, ineffectual. They're just, like I said, they're... Okay, and one nice thing about turning people into chumps. This is what I, my concern was about psychology. Not all psychologists. There's some, some psychologists that are very good, and I've heard a lot of psychologists, you know, giving uh, some good lectures and having some good things to say. And I do think Jordan Peterson says a lot of good stuff, but he also says a lot of bad stuff and a lot of stupid stuff. And he's also a major promoter of drugs, trying to push patients towards, you know, taking all these psychiatric pills. Um, and so I think that's bad. You know, then they end up on these pills, many of them, for life and get milked every day like a cow was like a chump. Okay, uh, some other advice that can come from Christianity. Here is a very famous, beautiful painting called Faust on Easter Morning by Johann Krauf. Okay, and what this was about in Faust, you know, it was uh, written about the poem was extended by uh, Wolfgang von Goethe. He basically said, Faust was considering committing suicide. I'm not supposed to say that word. <laughs> okay, and he drank... He was about to drink the, the stuff there that he shouldn't drink. And he looked out the window and he saw Easter Mass and he saw all the family so happy together. And he remembered when he was a child going to Mass with his family and the happiness had brought all those old memories. And he decided not to do it. He'd hold off, okay? And then his life got a lot more interesting and good after that. All right, but anyways, I show you that because... Um, and here's a quote by Dostoevsky. Some beautiful sacred memory preserved since childhood is perhaps the best education of all. If a man carries many such memories into life with him, he is saved for the rest of his days. And there's a lot of truth in that. So Dostoevsky, he had been condemned to be executed by the Tsar of Russia. And he saw who survived in the concentration camps and who didn't. And basically the Christians did. The more religious, the better, with a strong sense of purpose and good memories from childhood. Okay, so... Anyways, and here's what you tell somebody who's considering doing that. You tell them, look, your life doesn't belong to you. It also belongs to your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, your friends, and the other persons in your community. And why would you want to do something like this that would hurt the people you care about and love the most? Okay, and especially, you know, think of your poor mother, okay? Um, and so once the person is transferred, that responsibility for their life is not just their own. It also is its effect on the people they care about. 
that can help them a lot, okay? Everybody's sort of obligated, well, send them to a psychiatrist, put them on drugs, just because that's a safe thing to do, so you can't get in trouble for that. But a lot of times what they need is they need meaning. They need a purpose, okay? And, all right, so anyways, um, what else can Christianity tell you? Christianity will tell you how to live, okay? Live like Adam and Eve, but, um, you know, keep your indoor heating and plumbing. Be simple. Help each other. Love each other. Follow Genesis 129, okay? Be a low-fat vegan. All right, other things about Christianity in terms of, because what I'm getting at here is the, psychi the psychology of Christianity is better than the psychology of psychology, okay? So here's a typical Christianity painting, okay? Celebration of the baby Jesu Christu. And you see the love in their faces, their happiness together. Okay, that's a joy in life. You talk to anybody who's raised children, they'll tell you it's one of the greatest joys of their life, all right? So that's what Christianity says. Be fruitful and multiply. Love thy family. Honor thy father and mother. Okay, what does modernism say? It says abort your baby. Be, you know, all you should care about is material pleasures over the weekend. Uh, sterilize the men and women with soy, with atrazine, with F-, minus, with puberty blockers, etc. Um, it promotes divorce. Break up all the families. Get everybody divided by themselves. Divide and conquer all these chumps. Turn them into slaves. Every guy I know that ever that ever said he had to go to a psychologist is divorce uh, said that they all pushed for divorce. Now there, I'm sure there's exceptions to that, but the guys I know that's what they all told me. Um, and like I said too, how can somebody advise about relationships when they can't even tell you the difference between a man and a woman? And every time a new fad comes along, they always accept it. Okay, where is the where is the stability in that? Where is the truth in that? Okay, you want to talk about art? Christianity is like I said, it's better than art by a factor of a thousand. And one of the things, why is the art so great? Because art is metaphysics. Well, if their metaphysics are correct, if they're right about their metaphysics, enabling them to produce the better art, maybe they're right about life, okay? Okay, where's the, where's the art of psychology? Okay, here's Michelangelo's uh, statue, the Pieta, the most magnificent, beautiful statue ever made, all right? Uh, no one can compete with that. Well, why don't we talk about this, you know? You want to talk about art and meaning in life, here it is. The love in this in this statue, it's magnificent. It's the best ever in the world by far. Why is it that Christianity can make these things and no one else can? Because Christianity is the best religion, okay? You know, some stupid religion, you know, where they're, you know, you go to the ancient Aztecs when they first went to over there, they got piles of skulls, a thousand, a thousand stacked up for all the people they killed, okay? Christianity doesn't do that. Look at this, okay? So... You know, I just tell you these things because I know young people don't know anything, and uh, I'll try to give you a little bit of education here, okay? Michelangelo, the greatest sculptor, painter. Well, he wasn't the greatest painter. One of the greatest painters ever lived. Certainly the greatest overall artist who ever lived. He's also an architect. Here he is. Uh, he devoted all his art to God. Johann Sebastian Bach, the best composer who ever lived. He devoted all his work to God, okay? Isaac Newton, probably the smartest guy who ever lived. In one year, he invented calculus and the theory of gravity and some of the fundamental laws of physics. Okay, what did he ever say? He said he spent more time studying the Bible and writing about the Bible than he did doing science. What I'm saying is science comes from the Catholic Church, all right? And I've seen lots of great athletes, great scholars from devoting themselves to Christianity. They multiplied their achievements, all right? So it makes a person more powerful and strong. All right, so this is what I meant by the psychology of Christianity is powerful. Descend from the cross. There's another just artist. This is from 1435. Magnificent. Okay, here's the you know part of the school of the the landscape painters. Uh, this one is Among the Sierra Nevada Mountains by Albert Beardstadt, 1868. Kind of like the Hudson School River School stuff that came earlier with Thomas Cole. Look at this. Is this magnificent or what? I think it's like the most beautiful landscape painting ever made. It's just stunning in how beautiful it is, okay? And I've been to these places like Yosemite and stuff. They're magnificent, okay? This is what it's like. And, you know, how could you not believe in God and look at that? All right, uh, the Irish Christians, they basically saved civilization. They copied all the books and saved all the works from the ancient Greeks and the Romans. Okay, that's what they meant. It was the Irish monks. Okay, Thomas Cahill wrote this book, a very good book about how they did it. I did a book review on that in the past. And here's uh, St. Columba. And here he is, you know, copying the manuscripts in his schools and all the monasteries he started. They're the ones that made all these copies of the Bible. And they made, like, the Book of Kells. And I think it's a little bit funny, all the little 
uh, drawings in the margins, which reminded me of, you know, Sergio Aragonis in Mad Magazine later sort of took that approach. And also Monty Python's took that approach with their artwork, like in their movie, The Monty Python and the Holy Grail. One of the best comedy movies of all time. Christianity produces the best literature. Why? Because it has its metaphysics correct, okay? And, you know, the best novel of all time is Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Probably the second best novel of all time is Les Miserables, Victor Hugo's. And then the third best will be Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Why is it that the best novels of all time, they're all Christian? And then people say, well, Ayn Rand, you know, her book's up there. I wouldn't put it in the top five, but it's in the top ten. Um, Ayn Rand's uh, book, uh, Atlas Shrugs, magnificent masterpiece, but it's not as good at an emotional level, metaphysical level, but man, at an intellectual level, it's magnificent. Her book, The Romantic Manifesto, that's my favorite book by Ayn Rand. It's a much shorter book, her perspective on art. She really did the work in the scholarship. And people say, oh, well, she was an atheist. Okay, fine. She was an atheist. What does she ever say? She'll tell you how much she loves reading Victor Hugo. She says Victor Hugo changed her whole life. To read Victor Hugo was like walking into a cathedral. She'll tell you that perhaps the best book ever reading was Quo Vadis uh, about the life of Christ in St. Peter, okay? And then she'll tell you how great uh, Dostoevsky was, okay? So come on, give me a break. That's why I call her the closet, the closet Christian because all she does is say how much she loves the Christian authors. All right, um, you know, the cathedrals, the best architecture ever made, the best statuary, the best stained glass windows. Why is Christianity the best at everything? Maybe because it's correct in its perspective on life. Nowadays, you hear everybody say, oh, meditation is so great. They just praise meditation because it's harmless. You can say, sit on your butt and say, oh, and everyone's like, oh, that's nice. Because it's harmless. And why is that sort of promoted in pop culture? Because it's harmless. Ashok, when he took over India, he said he wanted everybody to sit on their butt and say, oh, okay? Because they're easy to control. They don't want somebody saying, I am a Christian. I will do what is right. I don't care what any ruler tells me. I will do what is right. Okay? They don't want that. Okay? <laughs> All right. Now, here's Aeneas. And again... Greek and Roman culture is absorbed into Christianity. Basically, the idea of Aeneas saving his father when Troy was burning. And that's also a message that's built into Christianity philosophy. You learn what you can from the, the people of the past, and you try to share what's good of that with the younger generation. And that's, I think, part of being a good man. And that's what I'm trying to do with this YouTube channel, okay? Be like Aeneas, trying to save Anchises, okay? Trying to save civilization and, and bring it to the younger generation so they, they learn where they come from, okay? Uh, Christianity quite easily can tell you where it comes from. And here's another uh, heroic person who I love, Thomas Aquinas, okay? Thomas Aquinas went and studied all the work of the ancient Greeks and Aristotle, and he showed where that was compatible um, and what to what a great extent it was with Christian theology and thinking and the culture of his times, okay? And this is a great painting of St. Thomas Aquinas saying, Hey, Christ, I tried... I did the best I could. I wish I could have done better. And Chris Hazel Chris would say, ah, you did fine. All right, here's another painting. This one is for the Pentecost, you know, after the death of Christ and the resurrection, 50 days after Easter. The flame is signifying the ability to speak in tongues, that idea of speaking in tongues, to go out and spread the good word. Um, go ye and teach others, you know, and I kind of joke. I, I parodied that. It's from Matthew, um, Gospel according to Matthew. But that's kind of what Christianity says, is go and, and teach people and, you know, try to make the world a better place. And like I said, too, the founding fathers of the USA, they were a bunch of Christians, like 98% of them plus. And they would, in the same buildings where they'd have their meetings, they would, their political meetings, and they'd write the laws and make all the decisions for society. That's what they had mass. They held mass in all those buildings, okay? It was they had mass in those buildings, okay? They all prayed together. They all went to church together. Thomas Jefferson went to church all the time. People will try to tell you, oh, Thomas Jefferson was an atheist. You don't know the story. Read his life in detail, okay? The guy would be a, 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 a religious maniac by modern standards, okay? He's funding all these Bible societies, always reading the Bible, going to church. Study the guy. You'd be surprised. He, he just cut the quotes of Jesus out for training uh, the natives uh, of the United States at that time. Okay, that's a whole other story. We're not gonna we're not gonna get into that right now. I made a video about him. Okay, here is the signing of the Declaration of Independence, and it was a bunch of white Christian men. Okay, and that's who wrote the Declaration of Independence and signed it. That's who wrote the Constitution and signed it, and that's who made you know United States the best country ever in the history of the world. Okay, and you need those things. That's where freedom comes from. It comes from the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. It comes from Christianity and the Bible and the idea that man's created in the image of God. 
It also works best when you have capitalism that is not rigged, laissez-faire capitalism. And it requires the ethics like Christian ethics, love thy neighbor, follow the Ten Commandments, be honest, okay? Because if you don't have that stuff, your society will not hold together and you end up with anarchy and uh, falling apart. Christianity also says, the reason I'm going through all this, what does this have to do with psychology? Because this is the problem with psychology. It can't answer these questions. How should I live my life? Who am I? What am I? What should I do with myself? Christianity answers these questions easy, okay? A man should be protective of women, okay? Men are physically stronger. The world's a rough, dangerous place, so men should be protective of women, okay? And women at the same time should honor the man in their life, you know, whatever is relevant in their relationship. And again, look at this magnificent art. It's just beautiful. Okay, and Christianity, Christianity also lets a person go their own way if they... If they march to the beat of a different drummer, so to speak, you know, like here's St. Elizabeth. She didn't want to be a queen. She wanted to be sort of like the equivalent of a saint. She became a saint and, you know, help the poor. They're fine. Great. Make her a saint. She's great. So it allows people to be who they want to be. Um, look at GW praying, okay, outside of Valley Forge, another really heroic guy. And he's sort of like the, the Christian hero of leadership. What did he do? Once he had achieved power, he had saved uh, the USA from the British at that time, he was like Cincinnatus, okay, like the great Roman. He turned over his power. He didn't want it. They, had, they made him president, but he didn't even want to be president. He kind of wanted to go back to his farm. But what I'm trying to say is he wasn't out to seize power for himself. He was out to maintain freedom, and he was happy to go back to his farm with his family. He was a great man, okay, the founding father of the country. Okay, Pygmalion effect is that people tend to respond to high expectations. So Pygmalion was the statue, like, like kind of like Galatea's story, where uh, it came to life, all right? High expectations and the hope of the sculptor. And so what does this come from? Part of this comes from Goethe. Goethe had a quote, if we take a man as he is, we make him worse. If we take him as he should be, we can help him to become what he is capable of being. And Viktor Frankl emphasized the same thing. He said, yeah, you should... Give the person the benefit of the doubt and hope the best for them, expect the best for them, encourage the best for them, and you'll be more likely for them to develop themselves to the best possible level they're capable of doing. Okay? Oh, I like this by St. Anthony Claret. He said, love is the most necessary of virtues. And you'll see that. Think about a mother. Okay? How does a mother and a father make it through all the problems that kids have and guide them through? It's because they love the kid. Okay? You know, love covers a multitude of sins, you know, from St. Peter, okay? That's a big part of living a good life and making things work for people. You care about them. Uh, so you cut through the BS and you do the right thing regardless of any stupid uh, superficial rules. All right, so can psychology alone without religion provide a moral foundation or meaning? So that's what I'm kind of saying is psychology can do a lot of good things. There are a lot of good people who are psychologists. And then I know a lot of them really mean well, but what I'm saying is, without religion, if you say that man is not created in the image of God, then you basically said he's a talking monkey and he's not entitled to ever, anything. And it's basically showing contempt for him. And if you don't have contempt for a person, how are you going to help them? So that's a major problem for psychology. So what am I saying is the best psychology? Fine. Get all that education, but at, at the bottom line, the bottom of it, the core of your being, have a Christian perspective. And then you'll have a decent psychologist. Because without that Christian perspective, the money, the pressure will be send them to the drug mill, drug the crap out of them, and you know, give them a chemical lobotomy. Okay, or electroshock them, you know, give them an electric lobotomy. Or, or even send them to the OR, do a craniotomy and stick a wire in their head, and, you know, it's gonna be end up unfortunately more often than one would hope, like a lobotomy. Um, so also, like, what's your goal? A psychologist might say, well, our goal is to help the patient be able to take care of themselves. Okay, ADLs, activity of daily living. That's nice. Another might be, well, I just want them to be able to get along with their family. That's a reasonable goal. Um, another one might be, I just want them to be able to keep their job because they need the money to survive. Okay, those are all reasonable goals. But, you know, a higher functioning person, they want more than just being able to survive. Sometimes you have to just go for the nearest thing before you go for the bigger thing. But what I'm trying to say is, once you get beyond sort of something really basic and simple like this, psychology doesn't know what to tell you. It doesn't have any role models. Christianity has Jesus Christ, it has all the saints, it has the great figures of history that we just went through a whole bunch of them. Psychology doesn't have any of that. Okay, where's the art from psychology? Where's the literature from psychology that you, you'll tell a patient, read this book, read the Bible? They don't have that. I'll read Dostoevsky, read Hugo, read uh, Charles Dickens, okay? Um... Okay, so here's some quotes just by typical Christians. You know, Bing Crosby. The unity of the family is the unity of the nation. All right? 
back when holiday when Hollywood would have celebrities like that, the country was a much better place. Okay, Father Patrick Payton, a little poor guy from Ireland. Okay, remember he's the one who had the rosary rallies with over a million people attending. The family that prays together stays together. Yep, there was hardly any divorce. You go back in time to around 1960. Okay, there was hardly any S U I C I D E. Okay, back in those days. Uh, when the country is more Christian, okay? They take the Bible out of school. They take the Christian songs out of school. You got divorce, society is going downhill. Then they bring the drugs in. Um, all right, so William Kirkpatrick, great quote here. He says, Christianity has better psychology than psychology. That is true. Okay, like I said, all the role models, all the art, all the literature, all the drama, all the architecture, all the sculpture. What more do you want? All right, um, here's Will Durant. He says, the Gospels are the great. He, by the way, he's a super famous American historian. The Gospels are the greatest drama ever told. The redemption of fallen man by the death of his God. The philosophes, those are the atheist philosophers in France. The philosophes don't need religion, but the average man wants it. That's an important point. The average man wants it. Religion is not forced upon him. He wants Christianity. Christianity is not forced upon me. I can be any religion I want. I choose Christianity because it's the best religion. Okay, Religion tells him that his life is meaningful. That's an important point. Okay, you look at what does modernism and atheism and pop culture say. It says, the average man is nothing but a talking ape, and he deserves nothing. Nothing. He deserves no rights, no free speech, no property, no right to pursue life, liberty, or anything. He's just a talking animal, and he must obey his ruler. That's what it says. And if you think it doesn't, you haven't, watched, you haven't studied it. That's what it says. Okay? He's not entitled to anything. He has no right to expect anything. He's no right to expect freedom. He's no right to expect anything. If the atheism of the philosophers leads to despair for the average man. Voltaire and the philosophes wanted to keep morality and get rid of theology. Well, civilization depends on morality, and morality must be taught in childhood. And for a child to learn morality, it must be taught with theology. All of Western civilization is dying because it has lost the religious basis of its moral code. And one of the things, too, if you look in the Old Testament, here's what you will see. When a population turns away from God, they get put into slavery. And isn't that what's happening in the United States right now? The country's turning its back on God, and they're being forced into slavery. Okay? It's obvious. This is so obvious that it's like only all these modern ignoramuses who haven't read anything, don't know any history, don't know any theology, that they don't see that. It's obvious. And believe me, the communists know this. They do it on purpose because they can basically say, we didn't do this. It's just fulfillment of a biblical prophecy. Oh, they're doing it all right, but people are so stupid that it's just like a big joke on all these stupid people. All right, these are just a couple of references if you want. The Myth of Psychotherapy by Thomas Shaz, Psychological Seduction by William Kilpatrick. That's a pretty good book. The Soteria book about managing schizophrenics in an outpatient setting and getting much better results from the drugs. Okay, this is another book about the problem of psych drugs. Psychobabble, Failure of Modern Psychology. That's a decent book. All right, we got, I got a couple more slides here. Oh, this is the whole story of, of hell. Hell is, a, is actually a relatively controversial subject, okay? There's different perspectives, perspectives on hell. There's different perspectives on purgatory. There's the whole Dante's Divine Comedy and the Inferno and all that. So I'm not going to get into that right now. I love these paintings by Dino Di Durante, but there's some people who say that there is no hell, that it's not really in the Bible. Uh, that's a big subject, and there's people who claim the Bible is mistranslated. We don't, we don't have time to get into all that stuff. It's kind of fun stuff to study all that, but... Hazel Chris is the most important thing. All right, anyways, let me uh, just get on to some other stuff here. We should preserve our institutions. The Boy Scouts were a good institution. You know, we let the Boy Scouts be destroyed. That's bad. They were good. I went to the Boy Scouts when I was a kid. It was good for me. Okay, and here's what you get with atheism and, uh, you know, a lack of cohesive values and a lack of uh, cohesive religion and society and morals. Uh, and hopefully there won't be more of this, but unfortunately things have been going in that direction. Okay, here's what you get with uh, communism and atheism. You know, just slavery. Okay, all the, the monks and priests, they're just made into slaves. Don't think that's not coming for all the Christians and for the whole rest of society too. That's what communism wants, okay? This is a great speech read by uh, John Ruskin's greatest speech ever in the history of art of criticism and theology. I'm not going to read it right now because I've read it in other speeches, but it's 1853 lecture by John Ruskin. You can look it up. You go on the YouTube. They're, they've got this video where somebody's got a nice English accent that reads it. It's magnificent. 
Okay, and like I said too, where I end up is basically on the Schopenhauer quote and uh, Soren Kierkegaard's. He says, forget about living a happy life, lead a heroic life. Do the best you can to make the world a better place, to teach you know the young people what you think is beneficial for them to know. And Kierkegaard says, look, you're damned if you do it, you're damned if you don't, so just do the best you can while you can. Um, and I think that's pretty much what it comes down to. i got one more painting, I think, here. And I think this is kind of what it comes down to. This is America right here. Okay, society's falling apart. The Christians are all kind of lost, and there's a storm. And basically, the shepherd says, rally to the cross, let us group together and help each other and protect each other and provide for each other, and we'll be okay. Okay, there's some dogs that are trying to do the right thing and protect the sheep, but the dogs can't do that much by themselves. And eventually, if they're all divided, the wolves will just pick them off and eat each one of the sheep. If they, could, if they rally to the cross and help each other, um, and speak up for Christianity and for improvement of society, they'll be fine. But most of them are so stupid, they're going to stay out, you know, by themselves, not understanding what's going on. And so, anyways, I hope things are going to get better. But uh, this is all for real. I wish it wasn't for real, but it is for real. So, anyways, I hope these insights on psychology were of some benefit. That psychology can do a lot of good things, but it's got major glaring weaknesses that people should be aware of.